All right, well, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here today. You may have had to swim or paddle, but you did it. I'm so glad that you came to worship. Uh, my name is Austin. I have the privilege of serving on staff as one of the pastors, and again, so glad that you're here. If you are here for the first time, like Cam said, you've heard a few times by now, we're in the middle of a sermon series called How to Pray. Because we, if we read the Gospels, if we read about Jesus's life, we see that his closest followers, his disciples, the people who lived with him week in and week out, they drew near to him and they said, would you teach us how to pray? Like the people who were following after Jesus day in and day out, they had questions on how to do this well. And so I'm sure if you're like me in any way, our prayer life could improve, it could grow, we could learn how to do this better. And so we've looked at different ways to pray, to approach God. We think about it as like tools in a tool belt. How can we get near God? And so we covered different things like withdrawing and silence and solitude, having outer quiet and inner quiet in order to draw near to God. And we talked about adoration, how, how we don't just wanna treat God in heaven as a genie who, who we come to with our wish list, who can just, hey, if we just say things the right way, he'll give us what we want, but instead adoring him for who he is seeing him as worthy, as, as glorious. And then we talked about kind of the heart of prayer, which is petition, asking God. It really is at the heart of what we do whenever we come near to him. We're admitting, we're confessing that we can't do everything for ourselves, but we need him to intervene. God, would you X, Y, or Z? And then we looked at kind of a different variation of that. It's called intercession, where we're praying on behalf of other people or situations or events or circumstances that, again, are outside of our control. God, would you rescue this person? Uh, would, you, would you bring peace to this area? Lord, would you heal this person? And on and on and on. And what we've seen through different stories, what we've seen through uh, passages in the Bible is that prayer is really powerful, that all through human history, through the scriptures and beyond, all the way since the beginning of time, asking God to intervene actually has an effect on the world that we live in. And we, we read stories of people like D.L. Moody, who kept a prayer journal of 100 people who all came to faith in his lifetime because of his faithful and persistent prayers for these 100 people. We read about George Muller, who, who started many schools and orphanages, who, who literally, we read the story about how a, a milkman, his cart broke down outside of this orphanage who didn't have any food for the day, and so he brought milk to the kids. A baker had been up all day because he felt like the Lord told him that these kids were gonna need food. So we just hear story after story about really powerful ways that prayer has shaped and changed the world. Pete Gregg, the author of the book, How to Pray, we have it in the lobby, it's an excellent resource, I commend that to you. He has a quote from another book, and he says this, the hinge of human history is the bended knee. So like the most powerful, uh, altering, uh, history altering moments uh, down through human history, it has to do with prayer, it has to do with God intervening because humans asking God to do something. It is the hinge of human history. Just to show you I'm not blowing things out of proportion, we've read a few things from Jesus himself. He had really important promises, really grand promises about the nature of prayer. Jesus himself, he said, hey, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, like this tiny little seed, you could tell a mountain to get up and move and it will obey you. It's like, well, Lord, I've never seen mountains physically stand up and move. What do you mean by that? Last week, we heard Pastor Brandon say, Jesus gave this promise in John 14, 14. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. And so the question that we're going to explore today is, what do we do when he doesn't? He says, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. But what do we do when he doesn't? Or it appears that he doesn't. What do we do with unanswered prayer? What do we do whenever we're crying out, calling out to God, and it seems like our prayers are bouncing off the ceilings in the walls? Nothing's getting through to him. We don't sense his presence. Uh, we don't feel like we're getting an answer. Uh, we don't even feel like we're getting a no. It's just kind of like silence from God. What do we do with that? And last week, if you missed the sermon, I encourage you to go back and listen to that. Pastor Brandon laid the foundation of unanswered prayer. We talked about particular reasons why the Bible tells us God does not answer prayer. There are good reasons why God says, I'm not gonna answer this prayer. Again, we're not gonna have time to go through all of them again, but he says, hey, if we're praying with the wrong motive, 
uh, with the wrong theology. We're praying to a different God, not the true God of the Bible. And we're not praying in obedience. We're living in sin. That can hinder our prayers. And, and we're not praying with faith. We don't actually believe God can do those things. So there's a whole host of reasons why our prayers may not be answered biblically, theologically. But what if we're doing all the things right We have faith, we're living in obedience, we're speaking out sincerely, we have the right motives, we're praying in Jesus' name, we're doing all these things, and yet, there's silence. What do we do then? I wanna tell you a story about my middle son, Noah. I have three boys. A middle son's name is Noah. I've got a few pictures for you there. So he was, about a year ago, he was just about two years old, and we went through every parent's favorite phase as toddlers, and that's whenever they wake you up at two in the morning for no reason. Like, I know if you're a parent, you love that. It's your favorite. It was my favorite. I miss it dearly. I wish he would do it every single night, right? So I'd be sound asleep, and he would find different reasons to come out and wake me up in the middle of the night. And listen, that's a cute face, but whenever you wake up to a toddler standing over you with his eyes wide open, it's less cute. It's way less cute, okay? Especially when you're tired. They're just kind of creepy standing over you, right? And all kinds of different reasons. I mean, if you're a parent, you probably remember this. How many times your kid is like a parched, like they've never had water ever before until it's two in the morning. And then they say, daddy, I'm thirsty. (laughs) I'm thirsty, right? My favorite is whenever they're like, I'm lonely. (laughs) I missed you. I'm like, can you not miss me at 9 a.m. or 10 a.m.? Or daddy, I have to go potty. And I'm like, dude, you walked past the bathroom to get to my room. You know, (laughs) like this did not need to happen. But the most common reason why he would come and wake us up, it happened all the time, is he would say, Daddy, I'm scared. I'm scared. You know, a two-year-old wakes up in the middle of the night, it's dark, there's no lights on, no one else is around, and he says, I'm scared. So one night in particular, he went to wake me up, tell me he was scared, and uh, like a really good dad, I didn't wake up at all. Not at all. I mean, he did the creepy stare like right on top of me. He's like, Daddy, I'm scared. I remember this as a vague dream. Like it was fazy, uh, it was fuzzy, it was hazy. Like I must have had a long day. I I was so groggy out of it. I didn't even wake up. Like I felt like I was dreaming. I just remember him whining, Daddy, I'm scared. Daddy, (laughs) Daddy. (laughs) I must have rolled over, gave him the actual cold shoulder. And Noah He went back to his room and he cried himself to sleep. And so whenever we read the Bible, whenever we come to the scriptures and we read Jesus saying to ask and to seek and to knock, like persist, 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 sometimes it feels like we're banging on the door and the only thing we hear from the other side is not footsteps approaching to open the door. It sounds like a deadbolt is slamming home. It sounds like the lights are turning off at the house. No one's home, go away, is what it feels like. It feels like our heavenly father is sleeping and we can't wake him up. Like he can't be bothered to help us whenever we need him. And I'm willing to bet that you are either walking through this right now, you have in the past, or I promise you will in the future because unanswered prayer or the perception of unanswered prayer, God not breaking through to, to help us when we need him, that is something that all of us will experience. It's not an if, It's a win. There's a host of reasons that we could be drawing near to God in prayer and feel like we're having silence. I mean, some of you in here have a diagnosis or a sickness, either with yourself or a loved one, and you're like, God, you know, you promised to heal. You said you're a healer. I'm reading all these stories. Would you heal? And it's crickets. Or maybe our finances are a complete wreck and we're between jobs and it's like, Lord, I'm pounding the pavement. I'm doing everything that I need to do. I got my resume out there. I don't know how the, how the bills are gonna get paid. I don't know how the ends are gonna meet and yet it seems like nothing's happening. Or infertility. I, I know people in this very church, some of you in this church have been praying for years to conceive and yet the Lord has not opened the womb. Where are you, Lord? Singleness, some people are just hungry for a spouse, asking for that blessing, and yet it seems like the Lord is not answering there. There's broken relationships and friendships, and there's a rift, and Lord, would you heal this? Would you bring us together? And yet it seems like they want nothing to do with us. Or, hey, we have kids and family members who are lost, and they don't know Jesus, and we're saying, Lord, help me, save them, rescue them. You're a redeemer, and yet nothing happens, and no matter what we do, it seems like they're further and further away from the faith. They're more and more antagonistic to the faith, And so, God, where are you? 
So we have to be honest. Whenever this happens, it, it, it does things to our heart. It does things to our relationship with Jesus. I mean, the very first thing that you might feel is like confusion or disappointment. Because again, Jesus says, if you ask anything in my name, I'll do it. And if you're doing everything right, if, if you don't have sin issues and you're obeying, and again, you're doing everything that you can possibly do, and yet God doesn't answer, we can be disappointed and confused. Like, Lord, you had all these promises. What's going on? It will often lead to anger and frustration. Like, God, you see the suffering, you see the sickness, and you're not doing anything here. What is going on? And I think if we continue in this, it leads us to apathy. Like, I'm not gonna bother to pray to God if he's not gonna answer me whenever I call. Promises don't seem to come true, so what's the point? It's like he doesn't even wanna help me, so why would I go to him? I'm just gonna try to figure it out by myself. And finally, we withdraw. So instead of pressing in, instead of seeking him, instead of diving further and wrestling, we say, you know what, I want nothing to do with that. It's either he's not powerful, he's not good, he can't help me, his arms are crossed, he's sleeping, something's going on, and my prayers aren't getting through, he's not answering, and so I'm gonna walk away. Maybe that's you, maybe you've walked away from the Lord, maybe you know someone who has walked away from the Lord for the exact same reason, but we relate in such similar ways. I mean, this isn't just common for Christians, this is common for every human being, this struggle to, to realize who God is in light of, like, how can he be good, and how, how can he not answer prayer with all this stuff going on in the world, and so we see secular philosophers and artists and creatives all around identifying with the exact same thing. Sylvia Plath, a poet, she wrote, I talk to God, but the sky is empty. You ever feel like you're talking to God and no one's there to hear you? The sky is empty. The famed... Tupac said, Lord, I suffered through the years and shed so many tears. Lord, I lost so many peers and shed so many tears. God, can you feel me? Right, can you feel me? Do you even know what's going on? How come you're not doing anything here? And yet, even though those people are honest, nothing is more honest than the Bible about this. One thing that consistently strikes me as I'm reading through the scriptures is how honest they are about our experience. Sometimes I read the Bible and I'm like, Lord, did you know this was in here? Like, did you know they said this about you? I feel like this is a little not cool, you know? Like, are, God, you, you, you inspired this. Like, are you sure you want this in here? It doesn't like look real good. But I love it because the Bible is so honest about our actual human experience. It really reveals what we're going through. It doesn't seem to hide anything. It lays everything out exactly how we're feeling all the time. And so I just wanted to read a few passages to show you how, how much we can identify with the people in the Bible, the scriptures here. The Psalms, if you've ever read the Psalms, I think it's one of the best things that we can read through whenever we're going through times like this where God seems silent because all throughout the Psalms, we read the psalmist explaining the same feeling and articulating it so much better than we possibly could. David, in the Bible, King David, the man who the Bible says was a man after God's own heart, someone who pursued the Lord with all that he had day in and day out, certainly made some mistakes, but someone who the Lord said was after his own heart. David wrestled with this. David felt like the Lord abandoned him time and time and time again. In Psalm 44, verse 23, we read this. David says, awake. Why are you sleeping, O Lord? Rouse yourself. Do not reject us forever. Why do you hide your face? Why do you forget our affliction and our oppression? David's like, wake up. We need you. The book of Job, about a man who had everything and then everything was taken away from him. So the Lord, in his sovereignty, he chooses to test Job. And so he takes everything away from Job. And Job is wrestling for 40 chapters about the character and the goodness of God. Like, how could God do this to me? You know, I'm a, I'm a righteous and upright man. I trust in him. And so it's this really excellent book about him wrestling with God. And he never gives up on God. He says this in Job 13, verse 24, some moment of honesty. Why do you hide your face? and count me as your enemy. Have you ever felt like God was treating you like an enemy? The scriptures call us, they tell us if we trust in Jesus, we are his children, and yet there's times where it's like, Lord, are you against me? 
Do you not care for me? It seems like you're treating me as your enemy. And finally, the prophet Jeremiah in the book of Lamentations, Jeremiah wrote whenever the fall of Jerusalem happened, the people were exiled to Babylon. So he writes this before and after the fall, and it's kind of several poems about his experience. And he says this in Lamentations 344, you have wrapped yourself with a cloud so that no prayer can pass through. You've wrapped yourself with a cloud. It's like, Lord, there's no way that we can get through to you. That's how distant you feel right now. So why does this happen? Aside from the doctrinal reasons we talked about last week, I mean, we have plenty of good theological, biblical reasons we can give to you. We can give an argument for the justice of God, how he's good in spite of all the things that we perceive as evil and wickedness and suffering happening in the world. He's good. Like we can give those arguments, but it doesn't take away the pain of whenever it feels like he's not listening. It doesn't take away the hurt of crying out to our heavenly father and feeling like he's sleeping when we need him most. So first, I just want to lay this out here. It's not less faithful to struggle in these moments. So we just read the Psalms. This man who, David, this man who was after the Lord's own heart, he said time and time again, God, it feels like you're not here. So it's not less faithful to be honest about where we are with him, to struggle and cry out to God. But what we can't do is we can't do what the world does and stay in that place. We can't allow the seasons of silence to define us and define our relationship with God. We can't fall victim to being confused and then desperate and then angry and then bitter and then apathetic and then withdraw. We can't go down that path. It's not available to us. So no, we have to wrestle and struggle and press in and seek his face and seek his face and seek his face. As the scriptures say, come to me, seek my face, find me, ask, seek, knock, continue asking, seeking, knocking. So what do we do whenever we find ourselves in these seasons? I was praying about this sermon for several weeks now, just thinking, I, Lord, I don't want to get up there and give these people just a simple answer that seems like it's going to make everything all better right away. I don't think there is a simple answer. I truly don't. I think there's good answers. I think it's all difficult. But I think one thing that we have to do is that instead of asking where God is, we have to remember who God is. So in the dark, in these moments of the dark night of the soul where it feels like God is not anywhere to be found, like he's distant, like he's shut up the heavens, he's wrapped himself with a cloud. Instead of saying, God, where are you? Where are you? Where are you? We have to remember who he is. Not just who we want him to be. Not just what we want him to do. We have to remember who he is. It's one thing to read about biblical authors and characters who felt the way that we do, but it's another thing altogether to realize that God has put himself in our place. We serve a God who is unlike any other God, any other world religion, and the fact that our God not only knows what we're doing, knows what we're living through from kind of a creator, creature distinction, like he he can identify, he's like, oh, I see that down there. I see what they're struggling with. Like I can understand. No, he understands in the sense that he stepped down. Like God became man. He took on flesh. Remaining what he was, he became what he was not. He he took on human flesh. And so we have to remember who God is. There's three ways we do that. We remember Jesus. We remember that Jesus lived like us. Jesus lived like us. He was flesh and blood. How often are you struck with the fact that God had flesh and blood like we do? He suffered in a human body like we suffer in a human body. John chapter one, verse 14, he drives this this point home over and over and over again. He says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The eternal creator God put on flesh and dwelt among us, with us, his creatures. He's not passive. He came down. Hebrews chapter four, verse 16 says, we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. So when God's, whenever we, whenever we think God understands us, whenever he says, I understand you, he actually knows what it's like to be human. 
Don't lose that. God understands that Jesus lived like us. Next, he struggled like us. Jesus struggled like us. See, the son didn't just choose to come down and live in a palace, live a super wealthy, comfortable life. He, he chose to come down to this earth and be poor. He chose that. He chose to struggle through life with pains and trials. He had people despise him and spit on him and hate him and slander him all throughout his life. And then Jesus, we read time and time again, knew where he was heading. He tells his disciples, I'm heading to Jerusalem. I will be betrayed into the hands of sinners. I will die and I will rise again. He says it over and over and over again. He knew what he came for. And he still walked that path. He still did what he came to do. And we read as Jesus was betrayed into the hand of sinners, as he's praying into the Garden of Gethsemane, right before that betrayal takes place, he's praying to the Lord. And when I say he struggled like us, I mean, he felt like God was rejecting him. He says a super honest prayer in Mark 14, 36 in the garden. He says, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. I mean, hear that. Your savior was praying like, God, is there another way? Is there another way? I'm afraid I don't wanna do this. I don't wanna suffer and die. God, is there another way? And so many times in Jesus's life where a big voice, booming voice from heaven would say, this is my son who I love, who I cherish. Silence. Silence when he asked the cup to be taken from him. And so he's betrayed He's put on trial. The God who created the entire universe is put on trial by human men. They lie about him. A prisoner, a person who is a traitor is chosen to let go. Instead of Jesus, he's flogged and beaten and spit on. He's stripped naked and abused. He, he's mocked in the streets. He's forced to carry his own cross on his bloody back all the way to a hill where he's crucified between two criminals. Do you think Jesus felt the silence of God in that moment? Do we know he did? And from the cross, he cries out in Mark 15, verse 34, it says, and at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lemme sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus hanging on the cross in his darkest moment. He says, God, where are you? Why have you left me? The powerful part of Jesus crying that out on the cross is that that's actually quoting a part of scripture that King David wrote. So again, going back to the Psalms, King David wrote in Psalm 22, this is what Jesus is quoting. The fuller version just helps get us a picture of what Jesus was feeling on the cross. He identified with this on the cross so much that it came to his mind and he was expressing that out loud. It says this in Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer and by night, but I find no rest. This is how our savior felt on the cross. So he lived like us, he struggled like us, but finally, he gives us hope. This is how we remember God. We have to remember God that he gives us hope. You see, if that's the last picture we have of Jesus, there's no hope for us, my friends. But he didn't stay on the cross. He was buried and three days later, God vindicated him by raising him from the dead, by raising him from the dead. What does this show us? That even when Jesus felt the absolute rejection and silence of God, God was there even when he couldn't feel it. Even when it felt like God was not approachable, whenever God was completely absent, like God had completely forsaken him in every way possible, we see that God's hand was working even if it hurt him in the moment. And that's what we have to cling to. The hope of the gospel is that Jesus didn't stay in the grave. He rose from the grave. He conquered sin and death and hell. 
And I think about this, whenever I'm thinking about how God's silence, it hurts us so much, but he's still there. I think about whenever I had to train my son, Theo, my oldest son, Theo, how to ride a bike. If you've ever taught a kid how to ride a bike, they are terrified <laughs> and rightfully so. They've had these training wheels attached to them the whole time, just joyfully riding along as fast as they can possibly go without any fear of tipping over. And yet when you take those training wheels off, it feels like they're gonna tip just one way or the other. They have no sense of balance. And so if you're a parent and you teach your kids how to ride the bike, the best method you could do is to hold on to the back of their seat without holding on to your kid and you have them pedal. So you're holding them up, you're holding them up, you're holding them up, and then finally when they understand how to pedal and balance, you can let go. My friends, that's what it feels like whenever God is being silent. It's like he's totally absent. He's taken the training wheels off. We're going to tip over. We're going to crash and die. But in reality, God is holding onto our seat, holding us up, even when we can't sense him, even when we can't feel him. When I was teaching my son Theo, he says, Dad, Dad, where are you? And I said, I'm here. I've got you. I'm still holding on to you. Keep pedaling. Keep going. I'm right here with you. And so often that's what the Lord does in our life. He's holding on even when we can't sense him. And so we have hope because we have to look to the resurrection. We have to know that even in our dark moments, the Lord is guiding us. He's holding on to us. He's there for us. He's not sleeping. The first Thessalonians chapter four, verse 13 says, we do not grieve as those who have no hope. The world who doesn't know Jesus, they have no hope. Uh, there's no reason, there's no hope for the future. They can't possibly look to anything that would get them through this season. But my friends, when it feels like God's not answering, when he's silent, when he's distant from us, we have to remember who he is. And we do not grieve as those who have no hope. And so if the Father did this for Jesus, he will do the same thing for us. He will do all that he promises for us. He will rescue and redeem us. He will never leave or forsake us and he will make all things new. The end of Psalm 22 that David wrote and Jesus quoted, I think Jesus would have had this in mind as well. Psalm 22, verse 23 and 24, he says this, you who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him and stand in all of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. And he has not hidden his face from him, but he has heard when he cried to him. You know, I only told the first half of the story about my son falling asleep. It made me look like dad of the year. I totally understand. <laughs> Fell asleep, didn't wake up, let my son cry himself to sleep. Terrible dad. However, <laughs> later that night, the same night, I was still sleeping. He was crying so loud from his bedroom. The poor guy, he woke me up from my bed. So I didn't roll over this time. I got out of bed, I'd wearily trudged to the bedroom. I scooped him up. I brought him back to my bed and we just laid there and he held my face and he wasn't crying and he fell asleep. See, unlike me, the father is never sleeping. He's never got too much on his plate. He's never unaware of what's going on in your life. He's never cold or distant. He never has his arms crossed at your troubles and your problems. No, he's right there with you. He's right there with you. Even if you can't sense his presence in the moment, he is holding on to you like, like a parent teaching their kid how to ride a bike. He is with you all the time with tears in his eyes. He's storing up every one of your tears. He's holding them near to him and he has an answer fixed in his mind. Even if we can't perceive it, the Lord is there. But if you can't sense that, and maybe this is you today, you can't sense his presence. Maybe it feels like your prayers aren't reaching him. How do we move forward? Because we can't stay there. We can't stay there. I think there's a few, a few things that we can begin to do this week, hopefully to help move us on. The first thing is to give him what you've got. We've said time and time again, God is not interested in you manufacturing prayers to him. Hey, he doesn't want you to pretend like you're someone else. He doesn't want you to pray in King James English because it sounds better. He wants you to tell him what's on your mind, what's in your heart, what you're feeling in that moment. And so if it's despair, give him your despair. 
If it's anger, give him your anger. If it's questions and doubts, give him those doubts. Take lessons from the Psalms. Be honest with the Lord as you pray. We've said this quote time and time again. John Tyson, he's a pastor. He says, give the Lord what you've got, not what you ought. So don't, don't convince yourself that you shouldn't pray honestly because you feel like you have to speak something else. No, be honest. Give him what you've got. And second, remember who God is. Remember, instead of asking where he is, we remember who he is. We have to remember who God is. How has God been faithful in your past? Are there moments that you can look to whenever you feel like he's silent, when you feel like he's quiet, can you look in your past and say, he was there, he, he did this for me, he answered me there, he helped me here. Look outside of yourself, how has he answered those around you? Look, God intervened there, and he helped there, and he helped there. You have to remember who he is. And we rest in scripture finally to remember who he is. We have to be reminded of the promises of the gospel, that Jesus rose from the grave. Read these things, remind yourself of these things. And so we give him what we've got, we remember who he is, and finally, we don't lose heart. We're as tempted just to become apathetic and withdraw and walk away from the Lord. That's when we have to press in when we have to keep asking and seeking and knocking and waiting on him and waiting on him. There's an excellent book by Pete Gregg, the same guy who wrote the How to Pray book in the, in the lobby there. If you find yourself in a season where you feel like God is silent, I commend this book to you. It's called God on Mute. It's a longer book, excellent, excellent book. And in the back of this book, there's a 40 day devotional. So if you're like, God, I've got nothing. I've been praying, I don't feel like reading the Bible, I don't feel like drawing near to you. Hey, there's 40 days in this book that you can faithfully walk through every day with honest prayers given to you in this book for you to work through a season. I commend this book to you, God on mute. So don't lose heart. I'm gonna read a verse to you and we're gonna close out. Second Corinthians chapter four, verse 16 says, so we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison, as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. We do not lose heart. So remember, instead of asking where God is, remember who God is this morning.